very pleased to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, I personally learned a lot from, from his writings, and I'm sure we'll have Professor Richard Humerton from University of Iowa. Uh, commentators for the session are Professors uh, Fred Adams from the University of Delaware and Professor Alexandre Meyer from uh, Fundação Educacional Bush. Uh, started with Professor Richard presentation. Thank you. So, to which I keep returning, um, partly because it keeps changing my mind about uh, what to say, and partly because I think it's, uh, in a way, the most fundamental question in epistemology that is going to uh, affect tenability for most people, at least, of internalism. It's really going to decide, it seems to me, where you stand on the internalism-externalism controversy. Uh, so in this paper, I explore the question of how our understanding of epistemic probability will affect our prospects for finding a defensible view, uh, a de defensible version of the view that I call inferential internalism. Uh, foundationalism generally, it seems to me, has made a remarkable comeback. To be sure, the classical versions of foundationalism that sought to end regresses of justification with infallible belief or uh, direct acquaintance with truth makers has largely been re rejected in favor of externalist recursive analyses of justification that seek to understand non-inferential justification in terms of a belief's genesis. If you can't hear me, I'm not sure whether the mic's working at the back. I'll hold it a little closer. Let me know if there's any problems. Uh, still, both internalist and externalist foundationalists, however much they disagree about how to understand non-inferential justification, tend to agree that one's justification for believing any given proposition is either non-inferentially uh, uh, justified or at least ultimately traceable to some belief or beliefs that are not inferentially justified. There being justification for S to believe E might be a conceptually necessary condition for S as having justification for believing T on the basis of E, but it obviously isn't conceptually sufficient. If we assume that E represents the totality of S's evidence, uh, the most obvious candidates for the missing condition are the following. This is on the handout, uh, one through four. Uh, one, there's a correct epistemic rule sanctioning the move from believing E to believing T. Or alternatively, S is aware of or has a justified belief that there's a correct epistemic rule sanctioning the move from believing E to believing T. One can put it this way, three, there's an appropriate logical or probabilistic connection between the propositions E and T, or uh, four, S is aware of or has a justified belief that there's an appropriate logical or probabilistic connection between E and T. Now, after analysis, there may be no difference between the contents of one and three on the handout and therefore between two and four. One might argue that the claim that E makes probable P, for example, in the sense relevant to epistemic justification is just a way of acknowledging that there is an epistemic rule licensing the move from believing E to believing P. Or conversely, one might argue that all this talk about the correctness of epistemic rules is just itself a convoluted way of talking about relationships between propositions. So, for example, uh, there are rules of deductive logic that permit certain sorts of inferences, like modus ponens. But the most obvious answer to the question of what makes modus ponens a correct rule of inference is that there's a relation of entailment holding between the premises and conclusions of arguments having a certain form, uh, a relation that would obtain whether or not anyone devised a, a rule that acknowledged the existence of that relation. Similarly, one might claim that there's a relation of making probable, holding between premises and conclusions of good non-deductive arguments, a relation that legitimizes a non-deductive rule of inference. Now, while 
one and three may be alternative ways of making a common claim, it is important, I think, to decide the direction of the reduction. But however one decides the issue of conceptual priority, one also still needs to decide whether it's the existence of the probability connection or correct rule, or awareness of the relevant connection or rule that's crucial to the position of interpretation. And it's this experience on this last point I've argued elsewhere that gives us one, so only one, way of isolating a point on which self-proclaimed internalists and externalists often disagree. One might label the view then that insists that for one to be inferentially justified in believing P on the basis of E, one must be justified in believing that E makes probable P, where entailment can be viewed as the outcome making problem, call such a inferential internalism. Uh, leaving aside for a moment again the correct analysis of probabilistic or rule sanctioned connection can we offer for inferential internalism. Given that we seem not the least bit inclined to abandon the view that people have justified beliefs despite the difficulty they often have defending the legitimacy of their inferences, should we not at least suspect that the ordinary understanding of justification uh, requires nothing as strong as what's proposed by the inferential internalist? Uh, perhaps, but consider the palm reader who predicts that I'll have a long life based on the belief that I have the proverbial long lifeline on the palm of my hand. It seems obvious that a sufficient condition for rejecting the palm reader's inference as rational is that he has no reason to believe that the length of a line on one's palm has anything to do with the probability of one's living to a ripe old age. Or if my high priest predicts that the war I'm planning will go badly based on the observation that the entrails of a recently dissected bird are bloody, an epistemically rational person will surely demand evidence for supposing that features of entrails are correlated with success in battle before conceding the rationality of the priest's prediction. These commonplace examples and indefinitely many others like them surely indicate that we do embrace the inferential internalist account of what's necessary for inferential justification. Well, Mike Humer, uh, in an article, objects to the above argument for inferential internalism. Uh, he argues that the examples I used to make, uh, at least initially, attractive the principle are misleading in that they inappropriately characterize the evidence from which one infers the relevant conclusion. Even palm readers. They're nutty, but even, even palm readers don't think that they can legitimately infer their predictions from propositions describing the character of a person's palm, and from that information alone. And I suspect that the priests at Delphi didn't think of themselves as inferring truths about battles from the appearance of entrails, and from that alone. It should be a truism that much of the argument we actually give outside of a philosophical context and sometimes in a philosophical context, is highly compressed, highly enthymematic. As we ordinarily use the term evidence, we surely do characterize litmus papers turning red in the solution as evidence that the solution is uh, acidic. But it's surely obvious upon reflection that one's evidence for believing that the solution is acidic is not the color of the litmus paper by itself. To legitimately draw the conclusion, one would need an additional premise, uh, most likely a premise describing a correlation between the color of litmus paper and the solution and the character of that solution. So once one realizes that the reasoning in the examples I discussed above is enthymematic, one is positioned to respond to that appearance of an argument for inferential internalism. For the reasoning described above to be legitimate, it is indeed necessary to have some justification for believing that there's a connection between palm lines and life expectancies, blood and bloody entrails and failure in battle, litmus paper that turns red in a solution and the solution being acid, but only because propositions describing connections or correlations of the relevant sort are implicitly recognized as critical premises from which the relevant conclusions are drawn. Uh, 
And as we saw earlier, internalists and externalists alike typically share the foundationalist insight that inferential justification is parasitic upon the justification we possess for believing the relevant premises of our argument. If palm readers relying on an unstated but critical premise describing correlations, for example, between palm lines and lengths of life in reaching her conclusion, she will, of course, need justification for believing that premise in exactly the same unproblematic sense that she'll need justification for believing the premise describing the length of the palm line itself. But that in no way suggests that when we fully described all of the relevant premises from which a conclusion is drawn, we should require that the person who draws that conclusion needs additional evidence for believing that the premises make probable conclusions. So while Humer is right, I think, in arguing that the examples discussed earlier do not support inferential internalism, uh, one can still make a strong case, I think, for inferential internalism simply by focusing instead on non enthymematic reasoning. We can easily imagine someone who is caused to believe P as a result of believing E, where E in fact uh, entails P, but where the entailment is far too complicated for S to understand. In such a situation, unless F sees that P follows from E, would we really allow that the inference in question generates the justified belief? Or, to make my case a bit stronger, would we allow that the person who reaches the conclusion has philosophically relevant justification or ideal justification, the kind of justification one seeks when one searches for philosophical assurance? Um, there is at least some concern that inferential internalism leads to regress, vicious regress. The view does remind one of Carroll's famous dialogue between the tortoise and Achilles. Uh, paraphrasing liberally, the tortoise admits at one point that P is true, and also that if P is true, then Q is true, but doesn't see why that's the reason to believe Q. Obligingly, but fatally, Achilles plays the game and adds an additional premise. Well, if P is true, and if it's true that if P is true, then Q is true, then Q is true. Even so, one just the tortoise, why does that premise, coupled with P and the C then Q, give one reason to believe Q? And so on. Isn't the inferential internalist in the position of the tortoise who keeps insisting that even when one uh, uh, possesses evidence that entails one's conclusion, epistemically rational belief in the conclusion requires yet additional reason for believing the entailment holds. Well, like the tortoise, the inferential internalist does require for justified belief in a conclusion something other than mere <coughs> justified belief in premises, which do in fact entail the conclusion. The inferential internalist does insist that the person possessing the justification be aware of the entailment. The requirement for inferential justification does not obviously suggest that the argument uh, needs additional premises in order to be a good argument. But even if we make that distinction, we should recognize that to avoid vicious regress, the inferential internalist may need to ensure that the relevant awareness of connection between premises and conclusion does not itself require inference from still additional premises. But more about that in a moment or two. So anyway, I've dwelt on Humer's argument against inferential internalism, not actually primarily here because I'm interested in the question of whether the argument succeeds. It seems to me that Humer's insightful argument reminds us of certain features of our talk of evidence that will be important to keep in mind when we evaluate the plausibility of certain views I'm about to discuss about the nature of probability, epistemic probability. So, since the paper's titled this, I should probably eventually get to talking about epistemic probability. Whether or not we adopt inferential internalism, we do need an analysis of the probability connection that by itself or as the object of awareness is partially constitutive of inferential justification or the conditions for the correctness of rules that sanction the inference, if you want to put it in terms of rules. 
Uh, earlier, we suggested two ways in which one might think of the epistemic claim that one proposition or conjunction of propositions makes probable another. We might think that the truth of the probability claim derives from the existence of a correct rule, as I said, sanctioning the inference in question, or we might think that our understanding of the probability connection is prior to and legitimizes our putting forth the rule that sanctions the relevant inference. So in the longer version of this paper, I had a long uh, uh, discussion of why you should do it one way rather than the other. Uh, but this is the short version, and in what follows, I'm going to simply assume that it is our understanding of probability as a relation between propositions that grounds our understanding of correct rule of inference. Uh, there may be synthetic necessary truths about what one's justified in believing when one's justified in believing certain other propositions, and it may be harmless enough to talk about rules that sanction inferences, but it's hard to believe, hard for me to believe anyway, that the justificatory status of inferentially justified beliefs is not fundamentally derived from relations between that which is believed. It doesn't depend on the content of what's believed. Put another way, it's surely a feature of the argument whose premises and conclusions are believed that is the key to understanding the justificatory status of the belief formed in the conclusions as a result of justified belief in the premises. So anyway, suppose we agree that a key to understanding inferential justification is an understanding of the relation of making probable that holds between premises and conclusions of argument. So what's the best way of understanding that relation? The debate has a long history, one that predates, but in many ways foreshadows the now famous internalist-externalist controversies in epistemology. Painting with a broad stroke, one can attempt to analyze probability claims in epistemology on the well-known model of relative frequency that's offered as a way of interpreting claims about the probability of an individual or event having a certain characteristic on a really crude interpretation of the frequency theory to say of something that is probably G is always elliptical for a more complex relativized claim of probability. One must refer the individual about which the probability is, uh, claim is made to some reference class, say the class of F things. The more perspicuous statement of the probability claim is one about the probability of A's being G relative to its being in the class of F things. And on the crudest and least plausible version of the view, the truth conditions uh, for the claim of relative probability are determined simply by the percentage of F that are G. The higher the percentage of F that are G, the more likely it is that something's G relative to its being F. Of course, we very often don't explicitly supply the reference class for a probability claim. When a great deal of time and energy has been spent by philosophers trying to figure out what reference class is the appropriate default for ordinary probability claims. Is it a class that's ontologically homogeneous or one that's epistemically homogeneous? Uh, if it's epistemically homogeneous with respect to whose knowledge is the homogeneity defined? I'm not sure that there are unambiguous to these questions and in any of the questions now. It's also fairly obvious constitute the truth conditions for probability claims are not actual frequencies. One will inevitably need to turn to counterfactuals or with all the problems that move me. Uh, one can turn to propensities if you like, but you can't explain propensities without counterfactuals anyway. Um, my main concern here though is the extent to which one can incorporate the alleged insight of a relative frequency theory of probability into an analysis of the epistemic probability that we're assuming holds between propositions. So one could borrow at least the spirit of the probability and apply it to between propositions in the following way. We could suggest that in claiming that P is probable relative to E, we're simply asserting that E and P constitute a pair of propositions which pair is a member of a certain class of proposition pairs, such that when the first member of the pair is true, usually the second is. Thus, in saying that A's being G is probable relative to its being F, and most observed F's being G 
I could be construed as claiming that this pair of propositions is of the sort, and I use variables, right? Most observed x are y's, and this is x slash, this is y, and most often it's the case that when the first member of such a pair is true, the second is. Similarly, if I claim that my seeming to remember eating this morning, call it E, makes it likely that I did eat this morning, P, I could be construed as asserting that the pair of propositions E, P is of the form S seems to remember X slash X, such that most often when the first member of the pair is true, the second is. So, so this view obviously resembles, at least superficially, the reliableness attempt to understand justified belief in terms of reliably produced beliefs. And it encounters many of the same difficulties. Just as the relative frequency theory of probability must inevitably move beyond actual frequencies in defining probability, so both the above account of epistemic probability and the reliableist will inevitably be forced to move beyond actual frequencies in order to define the relevant epistemic probability slash reliability and thus lose, by the way, any uh, intended strong connection between having justified beliefs and having true beliefs, or mostly true beliefs. Just as reliabilism must deal with the generality problem, so the above approach to understanding epistemic probability as a relation between propositions must deal with the problem of how to choose from among alternative ways of characterizing the class of proposition pairs to which a given pair belongs. In evaluating the reliability of beliefs produced by memory, for example, the reliabilist must decide whether or not to lump together faint and vivid apparent memories, apparent memories of events in the distant past and events in the recent past, apparent memories of emotions and apparent memories of memories, vivid memories that occur in young people and vivid memories that occur in old people. A frequency approach to understanding epistemic probability can make the same sorts of distinctions between pairs of propositions and consequently has the same sorts of decisions to make. Lastly, just as many reliabilists are troubled, I think should be troubled, by the implications of their view for what to say about worlds, possible worlds in which demons consistently deceive epistemically faultless believers, so a frequency theory of epistemic probability must deal with similar alleged counterintuitive consequences about what's evidence for what in demon worlds. Lastly, both uh, reliabilism and the frequency theory of epistemic prob probability will be an esma to the inferential internalist who is convinced that when these access the probability connections in order to gain philosophically satisfying inferential justification. The inferential internalist who is a foundationalist will need to end the potential regress when it comes to gaining access to probabilistic connections. If one's model for foundational knowledge is something like knowledge of truths made true by facts with which one's directly presented, there seems no hope that one will get that kind of access to either the reliability of a belief forming process or a probability relation understood in terms of frequency holding between propositions. So one of the historically most interesting alternatives to the frequency interpretation of epistemic probability is a view developed some 80 years ago by Keynes. Keynes wanted to model epistemic probability on entailment. He held that just as one can be directly aware of uh, entailment holding between two propositions, so one can also be directly aware of a relation of making probable holding between two propositions. There are, of course, obvious differences between entailment and making probable. From the fact that P entails Q, it follows that P uh, conjoined with anything else entails Q. And from the fact that P makes probable Q, it doesn't follow that P together with anything else makes probable Q. But for all that, we could still take making probable to be an a priori knowable internal relation holding between propositions, where an internal relation is one that necessarily holds, given the existence and non-relational character of its relative. P and Q being what they are, it cannot fail to be the case that P makes probable Q. It might also be true that P, R, and Q being what they are, it cannot fail to be the case that P and R 
makes probable not Q. So, which view of probability is correct? One might approach an answer to this question by looking at the most uncontroversial upper limit of making probable entailment, but it quickly becomes apparent that entailment's a double-edged sword when it comes to serving as a paradigm for understanding probability. The Keynesian will, of course, uh, be right to stress the fact that entailment and internal relations knowable a priori, but the frequency theorist or the reliableist can equally stress that valid deduction is a paradigm of a conditionally reliable uh, belief-producing process, a paradigm of pairs of proposition types, such that when the first member of the pair is true, the second is as well. Against the Keynesian, one might argue that it's patently absurd to suppose that making probable is an internal relation holding between propositions. And it does sort of seem crazy, I would admit, at the outset. Uh, such a view yields the absurd consequence that claims about evidential connections are uh, knowable a priori, necessary proofs knowable a priori. If anything's obvious, it's that the discovery of evidential connections is a matter for empirical research. But, while the objection might seem initially forceful, one must remember the point we conceded in considering Humer's objection to inferential internalism, why I spent so long on it. There is certainly no necessary connection between litmus papers turning red in a solution and the solutions being acid, or between dark clouds and storms. Uh, but then on reflection, we decided that it's misleading to characterize the litmus paper and the dark clouds as the evidence from which we infer the respective conclusions. What we call evidence in ordinary parlance is just a piece of the very elaborate fabric of background information against which we draw our conclusions. So we shouldn't expect to find Keynesian probabilistic connections holding between, for example, the proposition that the litmus paper turned red and the proposition that the solution is acid. But where should we look for a plausible example of Keynes' relation of making trouble? Uh, the obvious, though perhaps not all that helpful answer, is that we should look for it wherever we have what we take to be legitimate, non-enthymematic, and non-deductive reasoning. One needn't and probably shouldn't insist that even the probability connections between propositions are knowable a priori, that they're easy to know a priori. Some views, after all, all mathematical truths are knowable a priori, but as we painfully learned, or at least I painfully learned in math classes, their a priori character doesn't necessarily make the final for the course easy. Keynesians have been given considerable grief for the fact that uh, they may have come up with bad examples of alleged necessary truths about probability. Various formulations of the principle of indifference, for example, are notoriously seductive, but are also notoriously problematic. Uh, if it should turn out that there's no useful principle of indifference available to the epistemologist, it doesn't follow, of course, that a Keynesian conception of epistemic probability is doomed. The Keynesians should simply look elsewhere for plausible examples of propositions standing in the relation. The trouble, of course, is that philosophers don't agree with each other about what constitutes legitimate but deductively invalid reasoning. Uh, notwithstanding difficulties posed by Goodman's not-so-new-now riddle of induction, one might look at the relationship between premises and conclusions of enumerative inductive arguments. Less plausibly, perhaps, one might think about the connection between the proposition that I seem to remember having an experience and the proposition that I had the experience. Still more problematically, we might suggest that there's some sort of synthetic necessary truth that when I seem to see some physical object that's red and round, that makes likely that there is some object that's red and round. So how plausible is it to suppose that there are necessary truths asserting that our putative evidence in the above examples makes at least prima facie probable the conclusions? Well, how do you generally assess the plausibility of the claim that a certain proposition is necessarily true? Uh, 
uh, we often start by asking ourselves whether we can conceive of a situation in which the proposition in question is false. And here it seems to me that we're in a position no more but no less plausible